Welcome to Beyond the Lens 2022. I'm Sharin Roger. Great to be with you. We have a very special program for you that will highlight some of the work of our Fox 5 team members that you don't get to see on camera. Fox 5 has some of the most talented and hardest working photojournalists in the country. While again, they're rarely seen or heard, they play a vital role in our daily newscasts. And we couldn't do what we do without them. So this special is meant to celebrate their hard work, telling the amazing, inspiring stories of people across our region. So let's get started. Our first two stories are about men honoring those lost in tragic events across the country. The first is retired United Airlines flight attendant Paul Venato. On September 11, 2001, Paul had the day off and watched the terror attacks unfold on his TV. Now he has made it his mission to honor the flight crews lost on that day. How? Well, Paul decided he would walk the entire route taken by American Airlines Flight 77 from Dulles International Airport all the way to the Pentagon as a way to pay tribute to the lives lost. Fox 5 photojournalist Jesse Burkett Hall met him at the start of his trip. I was a flight attendant for a, a total of five different airlines. So that would tell you something, how much I love that career. People ask me, why did, you, why did you want to be a pilot? Because I didn't want to be up, up I wanted to be back with the passengers. I really had a, 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 a fabulous career in the industry until 9-11. Hi, Boston Center, TMU. And it all changed. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New, New York. I came in the night before off of that aircraft. At 8 o'clock, I landed in Boston, and uh, the next morning, those guys went out. Amy Jarrett, I worked in the back with her all the time. Michael and Amy were engaged to be married. The United 175 was the second plane to hit the towers. Al was a retired police officer from Al Albuquerque. Robert Fagman, he's the one that made a phone call off the flight. Well, this is day one. I'm pushing this beverage cart from Dallas Airport to the Pentagon. This is special because this is American Airlines Flights Route 77. Yep, I opened my big mouth. Here's the hill. I always say flight attendants have a camaraderie, just like police have a camaraderie and fire have a camaraderie. When a policeman or a fireman is in trouble, they get on the radio. They know help is coming. The difference with the flight crew is up there, nobody's coming. We know no one's coming. So we have to utilize what we have on that airplane. They boil water in the galleys to take the cockpits back. And it goes on and on and on. Under those conditions, it's mind boggling to me. So why did, why did we recognize these people as American heroes? They, they were the first ones to fight terrorism that morning. When I'm out here training and uh, my legs start getting sore and uh, uh, my back sore, whatever the case is, I look down at those faces on the top of the car here and I say to myself, are you kidding me? Uh, that how can you complain about a little ache in your legs right now? And you look at those faces and what they had to endure that morning. It's unbelievable. Yeah, obviously September 11th has left a lasting impact on all of us. But for Paul, he lost some very close and dear co-workers. Next up, another walk, this time for victims of gun violence. For close to a decade, 65-year-old Marine Corps veteran Jamal Johnson has marched from Philadelphia to the nation's capital to bring awareness to this growing issue. Photojournalist Nelson Jones talked to him along his journey. We're bringing the problem of gun violence and police brutality to our Congress people. The epidemic is just too overwhelming. We have got to stop this killing going on in our streets. Too much and too often and everywhere. I have family members that have been affected all the way around on both sides of the coin. And we just want to bring an end to it. You know, in Philadelphia, we just had some mass shootings over the last couple of days, 10 people killed. Um, it's just ridiculous, it's got to stop. that we get more help in combating the gun violence that's happening in our cities. All we need is a presence. You see, we need the presence. We still got the police. We just need a presence. But we just need a presence on the street because right now it's just utter recklessness going on. We have to address these problems and we have to do it now or else we're losing a whole generation. 13 to about 27. And these are the ones who seem to be, unfortunately, taking each other out, left and right. 
So we're trying to do something other than just use money. We want people to become engaged, but we need our leaders to be engaged so then the people will follow them. I'd rather not be hopeful because then I'll be disappointed. We're here and all we can do is our part. Yeah, all we can do is our part in gun violence, one of the biggest epidemics in this country. This year, the D.C. Fire Department celebrated 150 years of service. D.C. Fire and EMS started as volunteer fire companies back in the 17 and 1800s and became a fully paid professional department in 1872. In addition to their celebration, the department also took a day to remember those who sacrificed their lives in the line of duty. Photojournalist Aaron Kurtz was at the ceremony. Line of duty death, May 6, 1856. It's a bond, and it's a bond unlike anything else. It takes a lot for a person to lay their life on the line for a stranger that they don't know. May 18, 1896. Everybody knows that when you call, we come to help. We were so close, my dad and I. We were inseparable. I was a daddy's girl before it was popular. December 19th, I can remember the day. Um, my mother woke me up for school, and she came in the room and told me that um, dad was in an accident, daddy was in an accident, and he didn't make it. And the first thing I said out of my mouth is, what are we gonna do about Christmas? We already got his Christmas gifts, and Santa's on his way, what are we gonna do? And it was devastating. This was an opportunity for us to look back over 150 years, never forget, and move forward. And um, that's really what today's about. Nobody thinks about us until they need us. Uh, we show up at everybody's worst possible day, and we're there to try and make it better. But who's there for us on our worst day? He loved it. It was his life, aside from me and my family. He would say, fighting fires and saving lives is what I do best. That was his quote. But to me, he was a father. That's what he did best, being a dad. Now to a powerful moment at the Lincoln Memorial. Amputees overcoming adversity, coming together to walk the iconic steps for the first time. It's all thanks to the Baca Boot Camp, which is hosted by the prosthetic company Hanger Clinic. Fox 5's Doug Wilkes takes us there. Can you do that? My name is Malik Muhammad. I am 30 years old, so I am originally from Afghanistan, and I lost my limbs on bomb lightning. Well, what would I like to see? We, we, got to, we can try right here. Yeah. I'm still learning and challenging my son. So my name is Cameron Clapp. 21 years ago, I had a traumatic injury uh, with a run in with the freight train. So I lost both my legs above the knee and my right arm to just right below the shoulder. After losing my limbs, life was, it was you know, in a, the downward spiral, it was really dark and I had a lot of fear, uncertainty, insecurity. Really um, didn't know what my future had. Having the, the, the opportunity to engage with other um, people in the limb loss community and just pushing the limits, taking it to the next level uh, in the recovery process. It feels really motivating. Um, for me as, uh, you know, because we all have been through so much. Honestly, I could have come to terms with it for a while. I was a little depressed and stuff, but that's what this is about. And to me, I'm like, if they can do it, I can definitely do it. Because I used to wrestle in college and stuff, and I'm like, I'm strong enough to do it. I just got to do it. I have to do it, right? I live a better quality of life than I did before. It's more fulfilled, if you can understand that. Everybody, all different levels of recovery, of the rehabilitation, and seeing these, you know, amazing transitions and breakthrough moments, and, and people motivated and taking away this positive energy and this momentum that they get here at this this amazing event, and when they go home, they can just carry that with them and keep, you know, uh, keep charging forward.
and uh, making progress in their life, you know, to be independent and to live life with freedom, uh, utilizing prosthetics to the best of their ability. It's incredible. I have watched this story three, four times now, and I draw so much strength from it, right? If you put your mind to it, anything is possible. All right, don't go anywhere. Well, we still have a lot more stories to showcase still ahead. A local senior is helping keep Needlepoint alive. We're going to introduce you to 90-year-old Billy Chalet. Plus, he plays a vital role in the Capitals organization, and Biscuit will one day help someone as a service dog. We're going to take a look at the amazing work done by America's Vet Dogs. Beyond the Lens 2022 continues after this. Welcome back to Beyond the Lens 2022, a showcase of the fantastic work done by Fox 5 photojournalists over the past year. Our next pair of stories were done by Ama Arthur Ozma. The first is about a local artist working to keep Needlepoint alive by educating people and sharing her art with the world. Meet Billy Chalet. I got some forbidden stitch over here okay, to show I've you. Okay, I've never seen forbidden course, stitch. Yes, this is a solo exhibition. My name is Willetta. Angeline Chalet, and I'm known as Billy Chalet. I'm 89 years old, soon to be 90, and so glad to be here and very proud of my age. I'm at the Signal Financial Bank in downtown Washington, D.C. Thank you. I don't know if there's a place big enough for all of my work. <laughs> this is colored pencil. Oh, really? I'm an artist, and I have a passion for two mediums. My passion is for needlework and colored pencil. I'm on a mission to save needle art. You see Abe Lincoln? No. no. Yeah, I'm going to show you Abe Lincoln. Needlepoint is a very old art. Uh, it was done by our ancestors. This is my passion. I've done a piano bench for the owners of Congressional Plaza. Uh, Bette Midler's Rose, uh, Dionne Warwick. Billy's exceptionally talented when it comes to needlepoint. My name is Dionne Warwick, and I do needlepoint. And it's one of the most relaxing art forms, aside from my music, that I do. She's an avid needlepointer and an art collector. I think the art of needlepoint is basically dwindling, where it should be. Thriving. We're losing a beautiful art to the new digital world. So I'm on a mission to save and to preserve this art. And for those who will have the privilege, I feel it is a privilege, to view her work, I would suggest that they do. I don't feel that this is my best work. I feel that I can do better. And I hope that the Divine Master will give me a few more years and time to do it. Feels like a piece of camp. Piece of um, I would say that work is uh, already pretty amazing and beautiful. Amma, thank you for that report. Uh, moving on to this nine-year-old dirt bike champion from Clinton, Maryland. He's adorable. He's talented. He's fierce. He is taking motocross by storm. Amma Arthur Ozma also got a chance to speak to him about his passion. Hi, my name is Stephen Green, and I'm a motocross racer. Dominique Green. And I'm Stephen Green. And we're Stephen's, Stephen's parents. parents. <laughs> he was actually at a, one of his friend's birthday party, and uh, they brought the bike out for his friend, and he said, Daddy, that's the bike I want. And I kept on asking. And I'm like, man, we too focused on football and track right now. We're not getting no dirt bike. <laughs> so they couldn't get the bike started, and all you hear was, my daddy could start it. And so I got it started, and once I started it, I looked over, and I seen his eyes was lit up. So I talked to my wife, and... A couple of days later, we got him one. Got him a bike. And then I got one. When I first got it, I was just doing it for fun. And then after my first race, it just took off. When he first started, I had him padded up from head to toe. <laughs> I was scared. Like, two wheels scares me. Like, when you look at it, it looks like everything is huge. Like, you won't be able to do it. But once you, like, start riding it, like everything just gets small. And you'll be like, oh, this looked huge when I was looking at it. But now when I'm riding, it's really small. So you just go over it. I won a state championship 
He's won the Maryland State Championship. We actually ranked number two in the Northeast Regional. You don't have to do it to where though you want to do it for the rest of your life. Like you can just go to the track and have fun and just ride for a little bit. I'm just so proud. Ugh, I don't even know what word to say to be honest. Yeah, it's... I'm extremely proud of him. <laughs> See, sometimes you push your kids in one direction, but no, they tell you that's not the way I'm going. Uh, pretty amazing. We wish him well. All right, moving from dirt tracks to putting greens, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine veterans take to Congressional Country Club for the PGA Hope Golf Event. Help stands for, Hope rather, stands for helping our patriots everywhere. Fox 5 photojournalist Nelson Jones shows us how golf is helping veterans in the next phase of their lives. <laughs> PJ of America is using the game of golf to help veterans in their recovering process, whether they're suffering from PTSD, limb loss, spinal cord injury. I would like to call up the uh, voices of service. What so proudly we help. And we're using golf to get them to start thinking about other things than the trauma they experience and the trauma they're dealing with. And what we're trying to do is get them to focus on striking that golf ball. And anybody who's played the game of golf knows that you have to have a clear mind and be singular focused. This. Woo -hoo. So if we can get the veteran to do that in a round of golf and they shoot 110, that's 110 moment in time in that veteran's life that they're not thinking or reliving the trauma that they've been experiencing. And what we're seeing is now that's translating into everyday life when they go back with their family and things like that, just being able to focus on something else than the trauma they're dealing with are experienced. Oh, there you go. Is that the best approach shot ever? Uh, yeah, it was. I gotta I got be honest, I got lucky. Don't still tell nobody. <laughs> Gives me an opportunity to talk more <laughs> the rest of the day. You can't be thinking about if you have a bad shot, like you have a bad day in life, you got to leave that behind you. And that's what we're trying to instill on in our veterans. This year, we'll put over 7,500 veterans through one of our golf programs. We have over 200 locations across the United States. Um, all they have to do is uh, go on pgareach.org, and you'll see the military section, and sign up, and we'll get you involved, be around some fellow veterans, learn how to play the game of golf, and just start your healing process and use the game of golf in it. That's what I call taking care of our veterans, right? Mental health, it all starts there. Uh, don't go anywhere. After the break, we're going to take a look at the massive effort to find a home for thousands of rescued beagles. More be Beyond the Lens 2022 after we come back. Welcome back to Fox 5's Beyond the Lens. Uh, we want to end with some cute faces. In the summer of 2022, thousands of beagles were rescued from a Virginia breeding facility. Local animal shelters immediately got to work finding those dogs loving homes. Photojournalist Joe Hammond was at the adoption event and has a closer look at how the pups are getting acclimated to normal life. I love this organization. Say hello, Boris. Beagles are very popular, and for good reasons. They are generally fantastic with other dogs. They often get along well with cats. They love children, and they're a great size. I see you, Prancer. There are 4,000 beagles at a, at a now, a soon-to-be shuttered uh, breeding facility in Cumberland, Virginia. Um, these particular dogs were destined for life in research laboratories. Thankfully, that that particular company location is closing down, and so we've had the opportunity now to find these dogs all loving adoptive homes. Um, We're getting everybody all sudsed up and ready for their veterinary appointments tomorrow. So here. Um, and then we're treating them to a little zen night in what we call our peace out rooms, where they're going to hang out with our volunteers, get some cuddles, hang out in beds with some toys, and just have a peaceful night before they go to the vet tomorrow. They will do whatever they can to save as many dogs as they can, and especially these beagles, they are working tirelessly. Our hope, and we're going to be hitting this hard over the next couple weeks, is to really educate people about how these dogs are used and neglected in research and breeding facilities. So we're going to be doing a lot of public education in the coming weeks to share with people the fact that these dogs are being overbred and horribly mistreated. These sweet little, sweet little angels don't know how lucky they have at coming to a place like this, coming to Homeward Trails. I'm almost getting ready to go inside and... Hang out, huh? 
They have been through a lot. All right, let's get to our final story. You may know this good boy. Yeah, we're talking about the Washington Capitals service dog in training. Biscuit, he is pulling double duty as a goodwill ambassador for the Caps while also training to become a service dog for a military veteran or first responder. Sanan Davis gives us a look at the organization, America's vet dogs, and the important work they are doing. Shake. Good boy. Biscuit's an almost 12-month-old chocolate lab from America's Vet Dogs. The Washington Capitals are teaming up with America's Vet Dogs and working to train and socialize Biscuit to become a service dog for a veteran or first responder who needs him. It's great the dogs are raised not for profit, so every dog is provided free of charge to their clients. Maybe they have balance issues, traumatic brain injury that maybe causes maybe certain parts of their body not to operate like they used to, um, PTSD. Maybe somebody has a hard time picking something up off the ground if it drops. Our dogs are taught to retrieve certain items for their person and bring them to them. We raise these dogs for about one or two years and then send them back to the foundation where they finish their final training. Doing a dog class in a place like this is great because the dogs get to practice in high energy, high stimulation environments. She loves practicing her shake. That's one of her favorites. We like to think everything goes smooth as can be in our training process, but it doesn't. Being patient with our puppies, enjoying the process. I tell new puppy raisers all the time, one, you're enjoying this. You enjoy this process. And two, oh, you're sliming me. Your puppy enjoys it. Anybody can do this as long as you approach it with a good attitude. Beautiful. It isn't always easy, if you can imagine, especially our college students to take an eight-week-old puppy to do a lecture with them. I took a very heavy credit load when I was a student. I'm pre-med, so I'm applying for medical school now. And all I can say is it's so worth it. Oh, they are so cute. All right, Sanan, thank you for that. That does it for our Fox 5's Beyond the Lens 2022. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you again to all of our talented photojournalists for all the hard work you do every single day. We appreciate you. Of course, you can find their stories on fox5dc.com. We'll see you soon.